Today I want to talk though about triglyceride over HDL ratio. It's a very, very important topic. There have been quite a few lives saved looking at this specific item. So we'll talk about triglyceride over HDL ratio. So as you can see, we're going back and getting the website now populated with some of the original information, making more information more available to people in written form as well as the videos. I have recently been able to rewrite the triglyceride over HDL video, added a lot of information to it. And again, you'll see that blog come up on the website probably a couple of weeks. Hopefully we won't jump the gun on that one like we did on this recent one. In studying the content to prepare for the written version, I uh, listened to some interesting videos. The Drive, Peter Atia. A lot of people that watch my channel have seen Peter Atia. He's also a Hopkins grad. He started off in surgery in Hopkins and his video that was his claim to fame was a TED talk where he was talking about getting called in as a surgery resident to see a lady, I think he was gonna have to take her leg off. Diabetes, the lady was overweight and he was not treating her with the patient concern that he felt he should have. And here was the thing, he was blaming the patient. We often blame patients until you begin to realize that sometimes behavior is driven by biology. And in this case, there's a lot to be said about the hormone theory of weight loss. In other words, it's not that we get fat because we eat more, it's that we're eating more because we can't burn the energy that we're eating, so we remain hungry. If you don't know what that means, if that sounds really weird, get the book, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, Gary Taubes. It's a great book. It helps you understand a lot more about diet. Again, totally different topic. But here's the reason that I brought up Peter Atia. He made a pivot in his life and started focusing all on longevity. He's a great doc. He's got a lot of good content. He did a series with Thomas Dayspring, who's a basically national and world renowned lipidologist. Now, here's the quotes that they had about triglyceride and HDL. Peter says, and I think it's about five minutes into this podcast, there are a few things that humble me more than my complete and utter buffoonery when it comes to HDL lipidology. Again, Peter's a sharp guy. He knows more about HDL than I do, but clearly somebody that knows more than both of us put together in that space is a fellow named Thomas Dayspring. And his comment was very telling. He said, you know what? That's true of all of us. So given the fact that HDL lipidology or the study of HDL or quote, good cholesterol can be such a dicey topic, why would I venture to go there? Because it may sound like it. And a lot of people may say, what? I'm not an academician. The stuff that I talk about does get a little bit geeky. I was at a faculty full time at Hopkins for a while, but I never thought of myself as an academician. I still don't. My goal is to save lives. As you begin to look at this issue, you can begin to realize that it can save lives. One of the people who talked about that is a fellow named Chuck Smith. On the bottom right hand corner, Chuck's giving his presentation to a group at Louisville. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but he talks about how this understanding HDL over triglyceride, that ratio saved his life. So a couple of other things that Atia and uh, Dayspring talked about in episode 22 of the Drive podcast, triglyceride over HDL ratio is five times more predictive for heart attack risk than LDL. That was seen in a recent Framingham study. Lipoprotein particles pass both cholesterol and fatty acids around like hot potatoes. What? Again, that's an interesting concept that you'll hear if you go there. That may be a little bit more arcane stuff for academicians, and we'll skip over that. Let's make sure that we learn basic triglyceride over HDL lipidology right now, because it's really more a diabetology food nutrition issue than anything else. The basics of triglyceride and HDL are critical to health. 
The complicated version sometimes just isn't understandable so, or even actionable. I did a simple video on triglyceride over HDL ratio in 2017. The link is here on the page. It's a popular video. I think there've been about 60,000 views on that video. So let's go back and talk about some of the basics. What are triglycerides? Tri meaning three, glycerin meaning the glycerin molecule here. And there are three fatty acids that link up to a glycerin molecule. I won't go too deep in this. This is not gonna last too long. We'll get back to the basics in a couple of minutes. But this is fact. That's what triglycerides are. Now, what are the appropriate triglyceride levels? Once you get over 100, you need to be worried and thinking about your triglyceride. One to 200 tend to be listed as normal, or one to two millimoles per liter for those of you in the UK and Europe and other parts of the world using metrics. Lower levels than 100 though, or lower levels than one millimole per liter are optimum. Some disease states, I mean, these can get really high. Some disease states show triglycerides over 500 or uh, 500 milligrams per deciliter in the US or 5.7 millimoles per liter elsewhere. I've got several patients, 350, 400, 450, et cetera. Now, that's triglycerides. Let's don't get too much deeper into triglycerides right now. Let's go back and talk about HDL, high density lipoprotein. Many of you have heard of it and heard it called, quote, the good cholesterol. When those same people that call HDL the good cholesterol usually call LDL the, quote, bad cholesterol. Now, I'm not gonna go there. I've used that terminology in the past. I don't use it now because we know a lot more about these. But again, let's leave that topic for later as well. The final L in LDL and HDL stands for lipoprotein. Lipo means oil or fat or wax, and protein means protein. So what's going on is these are articles made up of a protein and the fat, cholesterol, wax, oil. And if you didn't have those proteins that would help these oils form a particle in your blood, you know, all you'd have to do is eat a salad with olive oil dressing and you could get what's called a fat embolus. That would be a big blob of olive oil in your blood. That blob could cause a heart attack or a stroke because it could block arteries. So that is the purpose of these proteins, what they're called apolipoproteins or the lipoproteins that make fats and oils form tiny microscopic particles that are not going to cause what we call an embolus or a blockage of your artery. So when you digest fats, things like HDL, LDL, apolipoproteins, keep those fats in a tiny microscopic area so you don't get the emboli or the blockage of your artery. HDL particles are considered to be responsible for, quote, reverse cholesterol transport. And if you go deep into some of the other videos, you begin to hear that this quote, reverse cholesterol transport or RCT, which you'll see referred to all over the science. You see it referred to in this little guy with a wheelbarrow who's taking the cholesterol quote away from the artery. You begin to listen and hear some of the cutting edge HDL lipidology and they're throwing this whole RCT or reverse cholesterol transport into question. Doesn't that shake the whole issue regarding health? No. The details of how some of these things work are still in debate. They're still being argued. They can still be very confusing. But the basics of how they impact our health are still rock solid. So hang on, we'll get there. HDL particles, again, considered to be responsible for reverse cholesterol transport. But that's where you're taking it from the arteries back to the liver for the cholesterol to be metabolized. Will an improvement in HDL result in better health? Yes, with few exceptions where you have problems with the HDL itself. Not gonna get into that topic right now either. But higher HDL means better health. How? It improves nitric oxide, it decreases oxidase enzyme function, decreases adhesion molecules, decreases monocyte, filtration, you know, the immune system activity that's attacking plaque, possibly, again, improves reverse cholesterol transport. Now, why is there triglyceride in the blood? The most common reason for elevated triglycerides is prediabetes. So now you're beginning to, to get to the basics of this. 
higher the triglycerides, the more we're concerned about prediabetes and or full-blown diabetes. And lower the HDL, the more concern we have about just overall health indicator, no matter what mechanisms, and there are multiple, that HDL does to impact health. So then you begin to see why triglyceride over HDL is an important ratio. Now triglycerides can also become elevated in several inherited diseases. They are diseases where the patient's body just does not metabolize triglycerides correctly. Chronically high insulin stimulates adipokines and hormone sensitive lipase. Now, why did I say that? Let's go back to this original comment. High triglycerides tends to be a sign of prediabetes. Now, how does that happen? Now, let's go back and repeat that. Chronically high insulin, which you get from insulin resistance. High insulin stimulates adipokines and hormone-sensitive lipase. The hormone-sensitive lipase results in the release of too many fatty acids and fat cells. These excess fatty acids take up space in the HDL and LDL. An enzyme called cholesterol ester transfer protein, CETP, facilitates the exchange of cholesterol in large HDL and large LDL with triglycerides. So here's what happens. You eat a meal, a few minutes to a few hours, you'll have VLDLs. Those are those are very low density lipoproteins. They're very large particles and they have a lot of triglycerides in them. Meanwhile, because of your prediabetes, your hormone sensitive lipase has been stimulating release of triglycerides. So you've got too many triglycerides circulating in your system. Hopefully that helps to start understanding why triglycerides are elevated with prediabetes. Now here's the other piece and it's in this slide from Dr. Dayspring. There's a CETP, cholesterol ester transfer protein, which takes cholesterol out of the large LDL and out of the large HDL and transfers it back to VLDL in exchange for triglycerides. Now, what happens then? That all might sound a little bit complicated. Why are we going there forward? I'll tell you why in just a minute. In the next image, it's from the patient charts that I see time after time, day after day, example after example. We'll see this on the labs. Triglyceride rich HDL and LDL are in turn metabolized by liver lipase resulting in loss of the large HDL and LDL. So in other words, when the cholesterol is taken out of large HDL and large LDL, liver or hepatic lipase metabolizes those large particles. Now I said, I was gonna cover something that I see in the vast majority of my patients, as in over 90% of them. This is a spectrum analysis of HDL and LDL in patient blood. You see here on the vertical, we have total lipoprotein mass. So that's mass. And you see along the horizontal, we've got diameter. So same mass, lower diameter, you're gonna see HDL. Same mass, higher diameter, you're going to see LDL because same mass, lower diameter, high density lipoprotein. Same mass, higher diameter, low density lipoprotein. That's how those were originally named using these techniques. And they didn't understand them originally, what they were before. So that's why they had the names HDL and LDL using basically just a uh, chart like this. Now, what you should have in a healthy patient is large, fluffy HDL and large fluffy LDL. So you should have a smooth bell curve on the HDL that peaks here over the large green image. Same thing on LDL. But what we classically see in people with prediabetes is it looks like a big chunk of the HDL bell curve has been bitten out of it, that, where my red mark is. And that's exactly what we see over and over and over again. So you see that this patient's HDL peak is way down here in the lower levels. So the HDL that they have are still not so much the large healthy ones, 
the large healthy ones had their cholesterol taken out of them, exchanged by, with CETP for triglycerides, and then the liver lipase has metabolized those large HDL particles. Now with the LDL, you don't see that same impact on the bell curve where it looks like a shark came along and bit a piece of that bell curve out. What you see is a shift of the bell curve. And that's exactly what happened with this patient. They have what's called, docs tend to call it a B pattern, meaning the peak for their LDL curve is lower. It's in the more in the smaller, denser LDL area. And that's not where you want that either. You don't want small, dense LDLs. You want the large, fluffy ones. So hopefully that helps what I see all day, every day. Let me go back to text because this patient also had a little FH and we'll talk about it for just a second to make sure I covered the details on the script. Decreased size of HDL is caused by this activity. The HDL should, again, have a smooth bell curve here. You get a decreased size of LDL particles. Instead of getting that bite taken out of the bell curve, you get a shift. In this patient, you have elevated triglycerides, 216. And so when you look at it, this patient had a triglycerides of 216 and HDL of 34. Just to comment back to people that are, have seen that original video about triglyceride over HDL. Chuck, for example, said that Chuck lost about 50 pounds working with a well-known low-fat diet doctor, Caldwell Esselstein. After the loss of the 50 pounds, he had a, a heart attack. That's not very common. Weight is a major determinant. And in most people, weight is the major determinant. So I'm not banging on Caldwell Esselstein. I'm not banging on or criticizing the other docs that talk about low fat. If you can get that body fat down, that is for most people the most important thing. But triglyceride over HDL is very important as well. As Chuck found out, for some people, it's the most important thing. After his heart attack, he started looking at my channel. He discovered this concept, this triglyceride over HDL. He looked at his and his was between five and seven, his triglyceride over HDL. If you're interested in Chuck's video, there are a couple of versions of it on the channel. He was driving a Tesla when his heart attack happened. He put the Tesla in autopilot while he was reaching in the back seat to get his nitro. But again, another digression for another time period. As you can see, this patient's triglyceride over HDL ratio is 216 over 34 or 6.4 at that point. I recommend a goal of one. And again, if you go back to Chuck Smith's videos, Chuck's HDL is now down below one from a high of five to seven when he had his heart attack. Now, there's one other thing I mentioned a few minutes ago. This patient also has an, an unusually high LDL. I've mentioned that many times. We've talked about FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. And that's why you tend to see such a big area under the curve for this patient for LDL. So this patient has a double problem, FH and prediabetes, triglyceride over HDL. As I've said many, many times, I've got tons of patients with garden variety FH, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. They rarely get into any problems until and unless another major risk factor happens. We've got several videos on that. Go one patient who, as a young woman, was smoking like several packs a day, had a problem, had an event, found out that she had FH. It was not recognized at first by her primary care doc. FH is rarely recognized first, and it's something that needs to be recognized. But again, as I've said before, FH is not something that tends to take us out initially like most people think. It is something that decreases our capacity. And most commonly, the thing that takes us out is triglyceride over HDL ratio associated with prediabetes and diabetes. I've gone down a whole lot of bunny holes. Thank you for your patience if you're continuing to hang in there. Let's just cover a couple of other items related to this. One of them is remnant cholesterol. Many people consider remnant cholesterol the most dangerous type of cholesterol particle. What is it? It's also called the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, TGRLs. It consists primarily of VLDL. You know, we mentioned that a couple of times. The VLDL and IDL, very low density lipoproteins and intermediate density lipoproteins are very short-lived. You eat a meal and you see them for half an hour, a couple hours in most healthy patients. How do you find that number? It's very simple. You take LDL 
and add HDL and you subtract that from total cholesterol. What remains is remnant cholesterol. You'll see a good bit about remnant cholesterol. There's a fellow that does a lot of work on the internet about remnant cholesterol. Remnant cholesterol particles appear only briefly after a meal. They're metabolized into other lipoproteins by the breakdown of triglycerides in that particle. This breakdown is accomplished by lipoprotein lipase lining the luminal surface, the inner surface of the capillaries. Remnant cholesterol is higher in serum with those with cardiovascular disease, 15 milligrams per deciliter or above. Now, next week, we'll talk about other parts of triglyceride ratio, why it's important, the optional triglyceride over HDL ratio, ethnicity. You'll see when you start looking up triglyceride over HDL that there's a lot of focus on ethnicity. I've got patients from all over the world, many ethnic groups, Yes, you could say that, but no, I would not use ethnicity as a major guideline. And we'll talk about that some later. How can you lower triglyceride and raise HDL naturally? I've got people doing it all the time, just like Chuck did. Changed his ratio from five to seven down to less than one. Most of that he did naturally. There are medications as well, and we'll talk about those. Medications which improve triglyceride over HDL. And the question, does lowering carbs, does that improve triglyceride, HDL, remnant cholesterol, cardiovascular risk? Again, all for next week. We continue to get great feedback regarding the webinars, and here's why. You know, on the internet, when you hear a webinar, you expect for somebody to try to sell you something. We're not doing that. We're trying to tell you something. People are coming in with their labs from Quest, Inflammation Panel, OGTT, Insulin Survey Response, and then they're finding out, do I have inflammation? Do I have insulin resistance? And where does that fit in terms of other folks? We're getting ready to start one for CIMT as well. So again, people are really excited about finding out their own status. Looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks.